What does the president of NASCOM say when he meets the president of the United States of America, the IT industry's largest customer nation? Well, for R. Chandrasekhar, it was probably just another day in the office because he spearheaded the IT revolution in Andhra Pradesh with Chandra Babu Naidu, went on to become IT secretary and telecom secretary for the government of India, and finally took on the role of president of NASCOM, where he did great work for the industry and made it really come of age. In fact, I was privileged to be with him on that historic day when NASCOM appeared on Times Square at the NASDAQ. Hi, it's a pleasure for me to be with an old friend, Mr. Chandrasekhar. And Shekhar, as we all call him in NASCOM and in the industry, has, of course, as all of you have seen, an amazing career, right, from government to doing a lot of work for us in NASCOM and in the IT industry. And he's really a multi-talented person. So let me start by asking you, Shekhar, just tell us a little bit about your life. I mean, what, what made you do what you did right from the Chandra Babu government or maybe even before that? And then, of course, beyond that into Delhi, IT secretary, telecom secretary, NASCOM president, everything else. So what's, what's been the journey? Oh, that's, that, that's a lot, actually. There's so much that has happened in that period. Uh, and it's uh, uh, kind of the whole flood of, flood of memories, actually. But let me start uh, with, as you said, uh, the uh, Chandrababu Naidu days, uh, because I had, uh, you know, at that time, just come back from Delhi. I had worked in the government of India. I'd done a stint uh, as uh, the Joint Secretary uh, Commerce uh, in the government of India. And uh, I returned to the state after five years at the center in 1996. Um, that actually, those five years were momentous uh, in their own way. Uh, and they are very relevant uh, to the Hyderabad story because that was the time when the Indian economy was just opening up, if you remember. 1991 was when the uh, opening up of the Indian economy was started under uh, Prime Minister Narasimha Rao and uh, Finance Minister Manmohan, then Finance Minister Manmohan Singh. And, uh, you know, uh, India was uh, sort of reawakening to the world and the world was reawakening to India. Um, so I had a ringside view of that being in a critical uh, ministry in the government of India dealing with economic uh, matters. That was also the time when the birth of the Indian IT industry as we know it today actually was happening. And uh, that the two happened more or less around the same time is not a coincidence. One uh, definitely uh, led to the other. And uh, that was also the time when in the government of India, I was uh, associated with the uh, industry, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a limited way. Uh, Divang had just uh, uh, been there for a year or two and NASCOM was finding its feet. Uh, the NASCOM office was all of one room in Ashoka Hotel uh, where uh, we were. And Divang and I, uh, you know, uh, met at that time. And he was a one-man uh, army, uh, you know, spreading the word about the Indian IT industry all over the world. And uh, in Commerce Ministry, export promotion of software and hardware was also part of my charge. So that's how I met him. That's how we actually traveled to countries. I remember we went to UK, we went to uh, Brussels uh, and got a project uh, for India to promote Indian IT industry. So he did a remarkable job. To cut a long story short, he did a remarkable job of promoting the IT sector. The government did also, I would say, in this context at least, an amazing job uh, with Mr. Whittle uh, introducing the STPI scheme. And uh, then magic happened. Uh, as a result of both of these. Devang, of course, did an absolutely fantastic job of marketing the IT industry by uh, highlighting the Y2K fears at that time and uh, the Indian capabilities. The uh, Western world and the US was in a tizzy because of uh, the approaching Y2K. So all of that uh, actually was uh, happening and we had a strong personal uh, friendship also in the process, I would say. So when I came back to Hyderabad, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Chandra Unaido had this dream about making Hyderabad an IT hub. Uh, and by that time, you know, the beginnings of uh, what has happened in Bangalore were visible. 
and not only the early shoots, but I would say even the saplings and the uh, young trees were also were already uh, visible. Uh, you know, companies like uh, Infosys and Wipro were already known by that time. At that time, uh, notwithstanding this uh, clear indication, Hyderabad had a very, very small fledgling industry because barely I think a couple of crores, uh, crore rupees in terms of turnover. And all of it was located in one small building uh, in, uh, you know, not a very uptown part of uh, Hyderabad. So, uh, but Mr. Naidu was driven by this uh, strong vision and the task given to me was, you know, that uh, in brief to make it happen. And uh, he had complete clarity of the goals. He was willing to back it up with whatever was needed and so both the political ambition and the political backing were uh, there. And, uh, you know, uh, based on uh, uh, what I had seen in Delhi, I think uh, in the context of opening up of the Indian economy, in the context of, uh, you know, associating with Diwang in the selling of the India story, it was clear to me that uh, the entire industry was driven by uh, the skilled manpower that India had. That's why it came to India in the first place. And it therefore uh, seemed very logical that within India, Hyderabad would be a good location because uh, as we found at that time, one out of every four Indian IT professionals in the sector was from the state of Andhra Pradesh, the, undivided, the then undivided state. So, uh, so the fundamentals were absolutely right in the sense that it had strong manpower, it had a reasonably good uh, urban infrastructure, but there were lots of pieces that were missing. And essentially the three pieces were, you know, uh, the uh, high quality infrastructure. While Hyderabad was a decent city, it really didn't have the kind of uh, world-class infrastructure that was needed for the industry. The second was skilled manpower. While the statistics told their own story, I think the need for institutions of uh, higher learning, which uh, would actually skill the industry, uh, you know, the human resources on a continuing basis, that uh, needed supplementation. Because remember, there was no IIT, there was no IIM, there was no IISC, there was no triple IT in Hyderabad at that time. So uh, that was the second uh, uh, prong of the multi prong strategy. The third was on really. Uh, creating a market also so that as people built their uh, companies, they could also find uh, avenues and outlets locally. And that gelled with the whole concept of good governance and technology enabled governance, which was another part of Mr. Naidu's uh, technology dream. So fitting all these pieces together actually made it very, very uh, logical and, uh, you know, an interlocking set of pieces which reinforced each other. Alongside that, we worked uh, uh, hard on actually providing whatever uh, enhancements of uh, civic infrastructure uh, were needed by the industry. Um, and all of this, I think, uh, really came together. But the one thing I would say is Bangalore happened. Hyderabad was made to happen. That was, in a nutshell, the difference between the two. I'm not saying that Bangalore, the government did not do anything. All I'm saying is that it, it was, it took birth and it started growing by natural, uh, uh, due to natural factors and reasons. Uh, in that sense, it was organic growth aided by the state, whereas Hyderabad was an inorganic uh, growth uh, spawned by uh, very proactive uh, state action. And of course, we had a wonderful team which helped us to, you know, do all of this uh, together. And all of us were driven by a sense that we were doing something which was significant. We all knew even back then that we were doing something which could significantly alter the economic journey of the state in general and Hyderabad uh, as a city in particular. And uh, so that's how uh, we went about setting up uh, the infrastructure through a joint venture with, uh, you know, Larson and Tumro, which was again a big deviation because the up till that point, the state had planned to start building, you know, some uh, uh, infrastructure and some buildings on its own, which would never have uh, made the cut. Uh, Triple IT Hyderabad was born as a 
one of the prongs. Again, uh, Divang had helped to bring industry players in. Initially, we got a few of the top IT companies to be a part of that and provide some industry sponsorship. Uh, and then the whole uh, e-governance idea was born in the national e-governance conferences. Uh, the first two in 96 and 97 were held in Hyderabad. So this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, how it all uh, began. And Chicken, if I can, Chicken, if I can interrupt. I mean, you, yeah. you mentioned very generously about Mr. Naidu. And I think all of us realized that while one could argue about politicians versus bureaucracy, this was yeah. one classic example of a very strong visionary politician coming in, but supported by your team. I mean, I still remember your team, not only yourself, but people like... Uh, Ajay Sani, who is, of course, today the IT secretary, Mr. Satyanarana, so many others. Yeah. So what does it take to get that sense of mission and purpose across politicians, industry, bureaucracy, and, of course, so many of us who are part of watching it happen and helping to make it happen? Yeah. Well, I think you're right that there is a certain chemistry. Hmm. And, uh, sometimes I call this, uh, actually, a conjunction of the planets. It doesn't happen very often. And it takes a lot to bring it together. There are many different moving parts. Uh, political backing is very, very important because not because the nuts and bolts are done by the politicians. They are done by people like us. You know, we are the team that makes it happen. But why it's particularly important is, first of all, there is a clear mandate. The second is that, you know, you also get good offices because in states which didn't value IT strongly at that time, a good officer would simply not post, be posted to the IT uh, department or any activity connected with it because they just didn't think it was very important. They said, oh, he's, you know, he's, a, he's a good guy. He's a very capable guy. Let's put him in the home department or let's put him in the finance department or something like that. IT, they wouldn't, they wouldn't think of wasting a good resource there, if I were to put it that way. So that is why it becomes important. And you know, the fact that it was not one, but a whole team of officers who were spared, all of whom were exceptional in their own way, uh, I think uh, uh, was, was really uh, quite, uh, quite uh, critical. So that I think is a, a very important aspect. The second is that, you know, uh, the fundamentals have to be right. You can have the best team, you can have, you know, great aspirations, but if the fundamentals are not right, you can keep pushing all you want, but nothing will happen. You know, people talk about the IT, uh, you know, journey of Hyderabad and the spectacular success. Uh, what, pe what many people don't know is that Mr. Naidu had a second dream, which was to promote uh, Andhra Pradesh as a tourism destination, which didn't happen. Uh, and uh, I believe that it was because the fundamentals were not nowhere near as strong as they were for the IT sector. So I think there are, uh, uh, and then the third is the question of timing. You know, it was at the right time. If uh, somebody had tried to do, even Mr. Naidu himself, if he had tried to do today what was done at that time, it would not have succeeded at all. Equally, if he had tried it in, let's say, the 80s, it wouldn't have worked either. So there's a question of the timing, there's a question of so many things, the government of India and the opening up of the economy, which I talked about. So all of these happening together is, uh, you know, what opens up a window of opportunity and makes it happen. Uh, you can call it. Talk a little bit about the role of central government. I mean, you did mention Mr. N. Vittal. And for those yeah. of you who uh, don't know, I think we mentioned it in the discussion with Mr. Harish Mehta as well. But Mr. Vittal, of course, was Secretary Department of Electronics. And he came up with this fabulous software technology parks of India scheme, which is in, in many ways given credit for you know, giving that Philip to the sector. But then you went back to Delhi Shaker and you also became IT Secretary and Telecom Secretary. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what roles any good central government bureaucrat or department or ministry, as we call it now, yeah. can play in really enabling the industry. Because we yeah. sometimes in our misguided belief, we think that we succeeded in spite of government. Whereas yeah. most of us who have been insiders know how much support we get from government. <laughs> but what is your view, being both an yeah. insider and outside? Yeah. Uh, uh, Ganesh, if you don't mind, I would just like to add one more thing about your in the previous question. Because... Yeah, yeah. I realize that there's something important that I have missed. Uh, you were asking about the importance of political uh, backing and you know the leadership and so on. I must tell you one interesting uh, factoid that the time that I spent in doing all this work, uh, building the infrastructure, setting up the uh, HR and so on, during that period, 
I must tell you that 60% of my time, if not more, not less, but more than 60% of my time was spent on warding off allegations in media, in the assembly, court cases in the high court, warding off stay orders from the high court, battling people like Dr. Subramaniam Swami and other people who filed, uh, uh, you know, uh, public interest litigations, uh, possibly with the best of uh, intentions. I wouldn't uh, question their intentions, but the point I'm making is that when you are doing something as big as that, there are a whole lot of challenges that you have to tackle just to make sure that the pathways remain open. And it is at times like those that the political backing also becomes extremely critical. Because if you are not backed up, you can not only fail, but you can also have you know, really disastrous consequences for yourself individually as well as for the state, both. Sorry, so to come back to, uh, you know, the... If you're talking about central government and policy and how it yeah. makes an industry successful. Yeah, so, so you know, in the uh, central government, of course, uh, by the time I had uh, come in there and I had already spent a few years in the IT department by the time I became a secretary there. In fact, I was called into the IT ministry uh, uh, particularly. I had originally come to the defense ministry, actually. But then I was pulled out and brought into IT ministry, possibly because of my past sins uh, to try and uh, and my mandate was uh, uh, at that stage, especially to build the whole national e-governance program. Uh, but the government of India as a whole uh, did not really have a plan. And that's what uh, I was tasked with. And therefore, policy really became important because when you look at the length and breadth of India and you look across states, then the government of India does uh, you know, become, uh, does play a lead role in creating that momentum. So creating a vision for e-governance and the important thing in creating uh, not just the plan, but the vision for e-governance was to really communicate the message that it is not a program of the government for the government by the government. It is a program of the government by the private sector for the people. Oh. That was the unique change that came about. And that's how programs like, you know, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, Computerization, the passports, uh, and a whole lot of other uh, projects happened. So that shift in the mindset suddenly brought everybody's attention because then it was no longer just about a few, uh, you know, uh, guys who were dreaming about technology inside the government, but it really became about the people. So that was, I think, a, a wonderful uh, experience in actually building that. Of course, when you're working at a government of India level, you know, you're very far removed from the field and from the action. So it is like, uh, you know, trying to operate a very heavy machinery with very fuzzy controls and uh, extremely uh, lethargic response of the system because different parts of the system respond at a different pace. Uh, so doing that in a country like India, where each state is like a country, the complexities are different and then building that momentum uh, is a completely different ball game, which uh, many times people don't appreciate. That's part of the complexity of dealing with India. So the insights that that gave, I think, were, were really quite unique. But most importantly, it helped me to understand the diversity of India far better than I already did. It helped me to understand how much technology could change things and also what the limitations were. And I think we had to be humble about the limitations as well. And both are important because then it's only then that you can have a realistic uh, approach. But over time, I think it's the paradigm, it's that mindset which has stuck. And today, I think the, uh, the competition and the effort in e-governance has always been, you know, how has it uh, made the citizen services better? Whether you take something like DBT or you take something like Aadhaar, which were later, uh, you know, uh, evolutions or which were later advancements. Uh, all of these were actually uh, designed for the interface be between the government and people uh, to actually become smoother. So that was uh, what it was in the uh, IT uh, uh, department. And uh, I think that was a very, very enjoyable phase because once again, in its own way, all these projects had their seeds at that time. The Aadhaar project, for example, was conceived by the e-governance division, developed completely, 
you know, taken to fruition by taking it to the cabinet, explaining the concept, getting people on board, getting the financial approvals, getting the uh, UID authority in place uh, so that by the time Nandan came on board, it was already something which had the mandate and had the whole plan in place. You know, there were similar things in respect of, for example, mobile payments, which was also initiated by the IT department way back in 2008. So all of these things also gave the same feeling, deja vu in a sense, of doing something which was immensely satisfying and which one knew even at that time that it would actually make a significant difference to the whole uh, development trajectory within the country. So in a sense, uh, yeah. all the stuff that you spoke about, I mean, you go right from entrepreneurship in Andhra Pradesh to e-governance, which of course has spawned so many ideas, and then the IT and the telecom. And uh, today, if you look at the trillion dollar digital India agenda, I think all these will come together and make that happen. I mean, so there is a huge a symbiotic role of industry and government to make something like this happen. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I think that is uh, something which is, uh, which is uh, unquestionable. The interesting thing, however, is that there is one piece of this uh, uh, jigsaw puzzle. And once again, I refer to the conjunction of planets question because India's digital opportunity is again like the conjunction of the planets. And it has come at this point because of several different things. One is, of course, the, the, the stage which technology itself has reached, you know, where you have these uh, uh, amazing new technologies like AI and big data and IoT and AR, VR, uh, all that stuff, which has made technology immensely scalable, highly affordable, very easy to use, and, uh, you know, very uh, quick in, in terms of implementation, all ideal from the point of view of a country of India's size. That we have an IT industry of a huge capability is, uh, again, serendipity in this context. Um, how we actually bring all of this together to attack all the problems of development that India is facing is an order of magnitude more complicated than any of the things that I have referred to in the past. And that's very much a work in progress. But there's one other piece on which all of this rests when you look at the India story, which is different from the industry story which was largely built on exports in the early stages. The India story rests on telecom as well. And that's where we had another miracle that has happened. The telecom story in India is often uh, recalled for all the wrong reasons or for all the negative things that happened in the telecom sector. But I would argue that uh, setting those aside, the telecom has been another amazing story of India's uh, success and the uh, rapidity of growth. And also the fact that that was the one sector in which India outpaced even China in terms of the rate of growth and the rate of expansion. And there were many things which happened in the government, in different governments, you know, it happened under different political dispensations as well. Uh, you had uh, early efforts with the opening up of the Indian economy when the telecom sector was privatized because till then BSNL was the only one uh, entity which was legally allowed to operate. Uh, but uh, when it was opened up, uh, private sector was brought in, but they had an auction process and the bids were so high that the rates were very high. Investments didn't happen and it didn't really make any dent at all. So it was only when the government flipped the policy and made a, brought in a revenue share that suddenly an explosive growth happened. So it required political courage to take that decision at that point. Remember, there was a real loss at that point, but it did amazing good for the, for the country. What happened, I mean, I'm just fast forwarding to 2010 when I was parachuted into the telecom department from the IT, because at that time, Telecom was in the throes of a crisis. It was rocked by allegations of uh, wrongdoing uh, in the uh, allotment of licenses and spectrum and all of that. And uh, there were cases filed in the Supreme Court. There were uh, uh, all kinds of issues. But the whole telecom success, which had been built on top of good policy making by the government, 
was actually on the brink of implosion and it was under serious threat of unraveling and if that had happened then i think uh, the india digital india story uh, would not have even been uh, it would not have been possible even to aspire to it let alone achieve it uh, and it can we are today i think uh, uh, doing many things uh, uh, well in that direction and the present government has really been you know pushing uh, uh, that agenda it's really got its foot on the gas pedal on that one and it's you know the growth of the telecom uh, uh, that is actually making all that possible so at that time my task in telecom was very simple fix it make sure that the sector is back on its feet make sure that it doesn't get completely derailed which was a very very tall order for those who uh, recall the uh, political and business environment at that time it was absolutely toxic and therefore to actually deal with that situation required two things and i often describe it as trying to build a house while putting out the fire in the existing one trying to rebuild the house while simultaneously putting out the fire you didn't have the luxury of first putting out the fire and then trying to rebuild it so the strategy really was to actually have a plan for rebuilding it which is attractive enough and which is exciting enough to get people to forget about the negativity and focus on what is possible it's a very long story and perhaps on some other occasion uh, more details can be shared but that was equally exciting maybe it is less talked about because it was more about warding off disaster than about actually building uh, something uh, big but in my own mind uh, that is uh, in its own way as important as some of the constructive uh, programs that happened in the in the past and actually if you look at it shaker into the yes. future i mean if you look at what's happened because of covid and you know so many people now okay working from home and people are being employed in small towns so it might actually present a huge opportunity but on the one hand there is the national optic fiber network project on the other hand there is the voluntary move to smaller cities so this could i mean as you rightly said if telecom it people culture come together i mean you might actually create a completely new industry which is 10 times larger and at the same absolutely. time not creating urban congestion absolutely so can you give us some i mean some i'm sure you have some ideas on how the industry could evolve over the next 10 years any thoughts yeah. on how how that can happen no absolutely i think uh, you know in some senses uh, my uh, next innings uh, which is uh, less very much less in the public eye but in my own mind uh, at least as important to me personally and as as satisfying has really been on how you now use all of these building blocks hmm. actually make a difference for india uh and i don't mean that uh, uh there was no difference earlier but it, this difference that i'm talking about now is qualitatively different from what the it industry had achieved at that time in terms of you know a, a sort of almost a 200 billion dollar industry uh, employing uh, you know uh, nearly uh, uh, you know 4 million people 4 uh, to 5 million people uh, with one is to four uh, ratio for indirect employment and all that that's a huge mind bogglingly huge uh, economic contribution but transforming india requires much more than that because of the immensity of the country and the you know magnitude of the problems that we face so the challenge going forward is really to turn that very powerful weapon that we have built and something that has now become our calling card all over the world as a country to turn that enormous firepower inward within the country leverage the telecom infrastructure as it is getting built especially when we stand at the doorstep of even 5g which we promises even higher speeds lower latency and so on and covid has taught us how to use the online better i mean we all know the limitations but we have discovered that we can do a lot more than we could do so the question is how do you bring all of this together to deal with some of the problems that have beset the country and have defied solution since independence no matter how much effort was put in you know how do you deal with healthcare how do you deal with education how you do how do you deal with financial inclusion 
How do you deal with skilling? All of these are critical. How do you ensure that livelihoods happen? How do you, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, reverse or at the very least stem urban migration because the cities are creaking? So all of these, to my mind, lend themselves to very innovative approaches using uh, technology. You yourself have been part of the whole India stack, UPI movement. So do you see similar you know, multi-platforms emerging for agriculture, healthcare, education, employment? Is that the way the country will progress using technology and leveraging it? Absolutely. It is, it is, in fact, already happening, Ganesh, as we speak. In fact, the, the uh, uh, health uh, uh, platform is being talked about. The health stack is being talked about. The uh, national standards on uh, uh, health uh, data have already been uh, in place for quite some time now. Uh, there is uh, the same uh, approach being uh, uh, worked on in the agriculture sector, although a couple of steps behind uh, the healthcare. Uh, so there are uh, many of these uh, uh, things which are being uh, uh, looked at. But I think one important uh, difference that uh, I would point to, and I think uh, uh, I definitely uh, have focused a little bit on that. In fact, uh, one of the initiatives that I've involved in is the Center for the Digital Future, which also looks at uh, some of these problems from a very different perspective. And that is that when you look at these sectors, uh, the developmental sectors, then there's no wishing away the role of the government. It's not like e-commerce, which can largely happen as long as the government enables it and keeps away from it. But in these sectors, government is a major provider of the service itself. Government runs educational institutions. Government runs hospitals and dispensaries and PHCs and so on. Government operates skilling programs. So government has two roles as a provider and as a regulator. And sometimes they get interwoven in ways that are not always very desirable. But the point is that ultimately you have to address the regulatory issues. The regulation has to be forward looking to enable these changes to happen. Otherwise, despite uh, innovation, despite powerful technology, despite a powerful industry, despite entrepreneurs who are uh, brimming with uh, confidence and ideas, uh, this still cannot happen because, you know, from a regulatory perspective, it's not allowed. Look at, for example, the areas like the map policy. We were constrained by a very restrictive map policy. Look at healthcare. Uh, remote uh, uh, consulting was, uh, in fact, not even uh, uh, allowed uh, uh, for a long time. It was not uh, legitimate. There are so many such examples that one can find in each of these areas uh, that regulation uh, is a key aspect and the role of government becomes far more critical. So those areas are not amenable to a solution by business alone and requires a concerted action by government and businesses acting together, regulation supporting businesses, and government as a provider uh, actually aligning with businesses uh, in order to uh, be complementary to each other. So I think that is really what I see as the next uh, stage. And I'm quite optimistic about that. Uh, as long as we don't look at it as a stripped down version of developed country solutions using technology, but rather look at it as souped up versions emanating from India, which are built from the ground up by thinking very differently and very innovatively. So that's fantastic. And that's a very, yeah. very, very nice way to look at it. So the last question I have for you, Shekhar, is your five-year stint as our leader, as the president of NASCOM. And you also obviously in the government dealt with uh, prior to NASCOM, there would have been the Manufacturers Association of Information Technology. Then, of course, there's iSpirit, which yeah. has played a significant role along with government. So just, just give me your views on what is the role of industry associations? I mean, have they played a major role in building this industry? Obviously, evangelists like Devang Mehta are well-known. Yeah. But apart from that, as an association, what role can they contribute? You mentioned the role of industry, role of government. What is the role of associations? Yeah. I think the uh, associations play a huge role because the government actually, because of the way it functions, 
and the principles on which government is based cannot listen to individuals, be they uh, persons or be they companies. And individual company uh, cannot be a credible uh, you know, uh, source of getting uh, definitive uh, policy input. So it necessarily requires consulting multiple people, getting multiple perspectives, and then distilling this into a, a collective or a, or, a, or a concerted view. Now, especially in areas like technology, where there are many nuances and intricacies, uh, the government doesn't have all the capabilities required to figure out what's right on its own. It does require input from the industry. But if it gets conflicting views from industry and somebody says you should do this, somebody else says you should do that, then you know who will resolve this? There is no concerted view. And I think that's where NASCOM has played a tremendous role over time because it not only brought together the powerful voice of industry as a collective, but also brought a homogeneity into the views from the industry. That's to my mind what enabled Originally, the STPI scheme to be born. Of course, there were very few companies at that time. But even later, it has been seen as a very collaborative uh, approach between the government and the industry because government sees only uh, uh, you know, wins in this area. Uh, more jobs getting created, more, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, more foreign exchange coming into the country. And uh, you know some of it spilling over into the domestic uh, uh, economy and action as well. So all of this, I think, uh, uh, is uh, seen as an upside, and that uh, synergy is uh, is absolutely critical. So representing a collective, homogeneous voice of the industry has been a very big contribution. Uh, it's not always the case, as you, as all of us know, when it comes to the domestic sector. Uh, Often there are, uh, you know, uh, sort of clashing interests. Uh, that's also the challenge going forward for the IT industry because as the gaze shifts from overseas uh, export markets where at one level the entire industry was aligned in exactly the same direction, when it comes closer home, the interests are not so well aligned, not only across companies, but also across different segments of the industry, you know, like startup ecosystem, product companies, the large services companies or BPM companies. So these interests are uh, not really that well aligned. But that's where, given the culture of NASCOM, which has built over nearly 30 years, that ability to really sit down and iron out differences and come to the government with a collective view actually not only makes governance easier, but it really enables those big steps to be taken, even though they hurt some segments of the industry uh, while uh, providing opportunity to the other. And let's be clear that in any large government policy, some people will be adversely affected. And ultimately, governance is about the greatest good for the greatest many. So that's where you know the industry bodies play a huge role. The second uh, aspect where the industry bodies do play a big role is in evangelizing the use of technology. I talked about you know, some of the opportunities in healthcare, in education, skilling, and so on. Uh, it's one thing to give the government an idea, but implementing it is also a big challenge. So the industry coming together and uh, actually helping to implement it, sometimes with government funding, sometimes by doing it through their own CSR and creating templates which can then be scaled either on a business uh, uh, you know, plan or on the basis of a government program. The only two ways you can achieve scale, either a government program or uh, you know, a, a business uh, uh, activity. So that is where, again, you know, examples uh, that, uh, for example, in uh, NASCOM, in partnership with the government centers of excellence in IoT, in AI, and all of that were built to actually create these exemplars which the government could then use to transform different sectors. And it is important to have those exemplars because that's, that's what demonstrates the need for regulatory change. And it's no use talking to the government with PowerPoints and uh, you know, long vertical document because nobody gets it. But a small demonstration works really powerfully. And there again uh, is where industry bodies can sometimes uh, play a big role. That's what the centers of excellence were aimed at doing. 
Uh, again, uh, in a program like Skilling, it is the Nas NASCOM Skilling Initiative, which was started, which really uh, also uh, demonstrated how you could do this at a high quality at a large scale simultaneously. So I think these are uh, uh, very, very big contributions and uh, NASCOM has been unique in that respect. Uh, and the kind of uh, collective uh, input that it provides and the collective uh, thinking and the collective action, which it continues to do to, to date, uh, I think is uh, a tremendous example and one which uh, many countries and many other industries within the country envy, I think. Uh, so I think that is absolutely one, one reason for our success. But finally, Shekhar, do you think, I mean, because many people believe that India missed the consumer electronics and hardware bus because of our focus on software. Uh, now with uh, productivity linked in incentive schemes, Atmanirbhar, etc. Do you think we have a second opportunity to really create a major electronic story from the country? First and foremost, uh, Ganesh, uh, I may be in a minority here, but I don't believe that India missed the hardware bus because of uh, our uh, uh, emphasis shifting to the uh, software industry. We missed it for a very different set of reasons. Uh, and just to illustrate or highlight a few of them, uh, I think, uh, you know, the Indian economy, when it opened up and uh, uh, we also uh, acceded to the WTO at that time, uh, in whatever uh, form it was at, at that time, the hollowing, the hollowing out of the Indian electronic industry at that point actually was one consequence, one of the negative consequences, because at that time, uh, the way that the whole system worked was that the hardware industry was brought under the zero duty regime, particularly in the IT and telecom sectors. And India, given its infrastructure limitations and other structural uh, infirmities that existed in the country, uh, it was impossible for an electronic industry uh, in uh, especially in IT hardware and telecom to compete in a high volume, high velocity, low margin business like electronics with creaky, aging, inefficient uh, regulatory and physical infrastructure within the country. And therefore, in the absence of the kind of duty protections that were there in the past, it was inevitable that the electronic industry would have completely uh, you know, uh, withered away. Uh, we are today realizing the consequence of that. Uh, maybe there were no options at that point in time. You can't accede to a global treaty without having some wins and some losses. Uh, so while we did not lose the electronics industry because we took our eye off the ball, one way of looking at it is that was the price we had to pay for our uh, software success. Uh, though the two are again not directly related. It's not as if uh, the software industry would not have grown if we didn't do that. But now, uh, you know, there is a different uh, kind of uh, opportunity. The same uh, challenges remain in terms of, you know, uh, not so efficient regulatory infrastructure. Of course, it's getting much better thanks to use of technology. You know, customs clearances are very quick. Income tax, uh, the processes are really... Uh, the envy of many countries uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, the fact is that some of those problems are uh, being uh, dealt with, but still some of the kind of uh, uncertainties that exist, you know, we have globally in the hardware business companies which run on 12 hour and six hour inventory. In India, you'd be crazy to depend on that kind of inventory because you would end up with, uh, with uh, outages in your production itself. So, but why is it uh, now Again, possible, uh, you know, to uh, revisit that. Uh, well, partly because, you know, globally, the world has started turning a little inward. And uh, I think India, in that sense, is also one of several countries which have started looking at, hey, what do I need for myself? Uh, the second is that uh, there are uh, uh, opportunities in the way that uh, the system works for newer technology products to actually be given some measure of protection. The third is that telecom is seen now as an intrinsic part of national security. And therefore, uh, from a security angle, it is possible to perfectly legitimately uh, create uh, requirements for any uh, equipment to come in, 
which has to meet certain criteria. And these criteria uh, could, in a sense, uh, spur uh, domestic, uh, man domestic uh, manufacturing as well. So the challenge and the trick here is to really leverage India's huge market size, remain open as an economy to foreign investment, foreign technology, and all of that, but build the domestic industry and domestic capability with sweeteners like the PLI and performance uh, linked and phase manufacturing uh, programs and things like that, uh, all of which are being done to some extent. So it's really putting all of these pieces together in an imaginative way uh, to actually make the hardware industry uh, great again, to borrow from President Trump. So no, that's amazing, Shekhar. And I, I think we are all, we are all party to hoping that this will be the next big success story. But thank you very much. As always, it's been a pleasure talking to you and I look forward to engaging more. Thank you. Wonderful uh, talking to you and wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to make a, uh, to take a walk down memory lane. I know.